Hi everybody, I'm Chris Kanish and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Today we're going to be talking about linking and loading executables. So if you read the book for this section of class, or even if you haven't, one thing that it doesn't really go over too well is why we care about this. I, you would think from what you've looked at before in CS261 or whatever have you, that we go from I've got some C code to I run the compiler and it does all of its cool compiler magic and it turns that into assembly code. And then we have a processor that can start at the first instruction and go down the list and just run each of those instructions. That sounds like our job should be done, right? You compile the code, you tell it where to start and you're good to go. Unfortunately, that is not the case. What we end up with here is that when we're building large software systems, like the kind of programs that you and I use every day, no one group or no one individual is going to be able to write basically any of those programs. They're gonna be building on top of what other people had built before. They're gonna be building on top of libraries. They're gonna be building on top of build systems that turn one little C program into something that actually works on an operating system like Linux or something that has a bunch of standard IO libraries in it so that we can say printf hello world. All of these things are necessary for us to be able to actually create a functioning system where people can write code. But all of this complexity comes at a cost. We have a system already that allows us to do all of this programming, all of these things. We can just run GCC and hit enter. But the cost there is that there's a lot of this complexity that's baked into the system. And what we're gonna learn about over the course of this lecture and this entire class is exactly how we're going to use those individual pieces and how we're going to pick apart that complexity and make it not as terrifying and vague and opaque as it would be otherwise. So we're gonna look at how to compile these programs. We're gonna look at how to compile them into libraries. We're gonna look at how to take our compiled program, not our linked program, and the compiled libraries, put them together and actually turn them into a running program. There's a lot going on there that is very, very complex, but is something that we will figure out over the course of this chapter. So one analogy that I like to use is this one right here, where I'm looking at what a linker does. And I sat there and I thought about it a lot and I realized that a linker more or less works like somebody who's putting together a home theater system. Now, it sounds a little bit weird, but stick with me here. So when you come up with the idea that you want to build the most amazing home theater system, you're, gonna go, you're not going to you know, open up the audio engineer's book and be like, how am I going to build a speaker? How am I going to build an amplifier? How am I going to build a head unit? you go to the store and you get some off the shelf pieces and you say, okay, great. I'm going to turn this into the most awesome home theater system I've ever had. And when we do that, there's, there's two steps that we're gonna to wanna to focus on in this analogy. One of those steps is picking the right pieces and putting them in the right place, right? You're, you're gonna have a, a left speaker and you're gonna put it over there. You're gonna have a right speaker. You're gonna put it over there. You're gonna put the TV in front of you. All of these things, are decisions that you're going to need to make in order to have a successfully running home theater system. And then after you've put all the things in the right place, well, nothing is going to happen because they're not connected to each other. You've got to run the audio cable to the one speaker and then you run the other audio cable to the other speaker and you plug the HDMI cable into the head unit and then you plug that one into your screen. All of these things are what you need to do to make a functioning awesome home theater system. Now, those two processes of picking pieces and putting them in the right place and then connecting them all together is effectively what a linker does when it comes to pre-compiled programs. First, you're going to choose which pieces you need to use and then you're going to hook them all up to each other. Just like a speaker has a bunch of little holes in it where you're supposed to plug specific cables in, you might very easily plug the wrong cable into the wrong place and nothing will come out, or you'll hear horrible screeching, or you'll have some crazy feedback. Any number of things can go wrong because you aren't necessarily plugging the right things into the right place, even if you do have them set up in your environment the right way. So one concept that's really important here that I didn't go over too much is this idea of a symbol. So symbols are this tool that we use to translate between fully programmer facing things like variables all the way down to fully CPU facing things like individual memory offsets. Because remember, a variable is just an easy way 
for a human to think about a memory offset. And some things that are variables are not always going to be symbols. Like for instance, a loop invariant is just gonna be a local variable within that block. It's never gonna to need to be re referenced anywhere else. Therefore, it doesn't matter what the value is to the linker. The linker does not care how a specific loop is using a, a loop variable like your ijks. It doesn't care what local variables are doing because they're never referenced outside of there. There are, however, a lot of variable names or function names that do get referenced outside of there. And the linker and the compiler need to keep track of those using this concept of a symbol. So the compiler is going to create a bunch of symbols. It's going to create a bunch of relocation entries for any symbol that needs to be resolved before this program can run. And then when the linker comes in and does its work, it's going to find all of those symbol locations and it's going to rewrite them in a way that allows the program to actually execute. So the raw inputs for doing this linking process are going to be relocatable object files. These are files that are in the ELF format. So this is the executable and linkable format. This is the format that we use for Linux executables and libraries. And it's got a whole bunch of different sections in it. This is all binary data that's been packed in based on a specification that you can go and find and read. But the basics of what we care about right now is that it has a whole bunch of these different sections in it. I'll just go over them really quickly. If you saw them in the book, feel free to skip forward. But in the text section, we've got all of the assembly instructions for the actual program that we wrote. We've got data that's read only that can never over the entire course of the execution of the program be changed. We've got the data section where you can do the same thing, but it is changeable data. So these are things like global variables. We've got a BSS section, which is a special section that is relevant for storing programs on the disk. And for what we care about right now, this is the section where we put things that don't need any space for them because they haven't actually been defined to something meaningful. So we can think about this, our very easy but totally wrong mnemonic is better save space. So then the next very important set of sections are the symbol table, the relocation entries in the text and the relocation entries in the data section. So the symbol table itself gives us the list of indices for all of the symbols in this entire file. The relocatable text section has a list of relocation entries, which are basically little to-dos that the compiler left for itself saying, hey, when you link this program, you need to go here, find this symbol and replace it at this place in this way. So you get both of that for locations within the text that need to be changed before this program gets linked into an executable file, as well as in the data section where things need to get changed before this program can be run. Note again that this is a .o file. This is something that has been compiled, but has not yet been turned into a runnable program. We also have our debug symbols, our line numbers, and our string table. These are, thing, these are all things that are useful for debugging the program, useful for disassembling the program, but aren't really useful when the program is normally running. The debug information will tell us what line we're on and what memory addresses correspond to which local variables. These are things that under normal execution are completely unnecessary. The loader actually throws this information out if it's not actually running the program inside of a debugger. It doesn't care what local variables are. It doesn't care what line number it's currently executing. It doesn't care what the human readable name for a specific symbol is. It just, it doesn't have time for that. So these individual symbol table entries look a little bit like this. They've got a whole bunch of different metadata involved with what they are. We've got the necessary things like what the string table offset is. So this is where within that string table, if we recall from the previous slide, the previous slide, you've got the string table that is, oh, you know, when a human is looking at this program, then here's what the human readable name is. Like I'm a computer, I don't care about humans and hum human readable names, but if we're gonna be debugging this with the help of a human, here's the easy human readable name for it. Uh, we also have what type uh, and whether these are, these symbols are local or global. We've got which section it's gonna go into. We've got what the 
section offset or the absolute addresses. This is gonna come in very important later on, I'm sorry. That, that value there is where that symbol is going to live in relation to a section that it lives in or at a specific absolute address within the entire address range of the running program. And then we have the size as well. So the size will actually tell us how big is that symbol that needs to get shoved in here? Is it a long? Is it just, a, is it four bytes? Is it a one byte uh, character that's gonna be stored someplace that needs to be replaced? These are all important pieces of information that are kind of these to-dos for when the linker actually goes and does its job. So this just gives us a really basic overview of what we're doing in this chapter, what our, what our tasks are, and what the idea of a linker is. And I'm sorry, I had to explain this joke because it's just way too awesome. I was like, how can I come up with a fun graphic that has to do with linking, but also has to do with my ridiculous home theater setup example? And so I found Link wearing headphones. Cause so that's pretty awesome. I, 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 was, I was proud of myself for it. I'm enjoying this, this picture. I don't know about you. you maybe, maybe you'll think it's funny too. So we covered three relatively important concepts here in this video where we're mostly talking about how we're going to go from, we've got a bunch of object files that are compiled C code to an executable file that's ready to actually be run by Linux's program loading process. One of those important concepts is symbols. So we have this idea of a to-do that the linker is eventually going to fix because we haven't put together a fully integrated executable yet. We've got symbol resolution, which is the process of finding the right pieces and putting them in the right place. And then we also have the process of relocation where we actually wire all of those things together because they're actually individual modules. They aren't already integrated into each other. So that's what we're gonna learn how to do over the course of the next two videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.